Hello, welcome to my first Mark Young broadcast podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about beer, swilling, whiskey drinking, and how it all began. So I'd first like to introduce myself, Mark Young, talking about my first experience when drinking alcohol. I, I must say it probably started back in the 80s uh, with a beer named Stoney's that was made from a small town in Pennsylvania called Smithfield, I believe. No, it might have been uh, Smithton, Smithton, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was a brewery, a small brewery. Uh, I actually uh, applied for a job there, but that's uh, another podcast. But anyway, uh, they made a cheap beer. They made different levels of beer. It was uh, called Stoney's. It was called Fort Pitt. There was uh, some other cream, some other type of cream beer. Uh, but mainly what everyone drank was Stoney's. Uh, there was some Esquire beer out there as well. But uh, for 24 bottles of beer, you could probably get it for $8 a case, which is unheard of right now. Uh, just visiting the beer distributor yesterday, I actually saw a case of Stoney's. I didn't actually look at the price. Next time I'll have to look at the price to see and compare. But they do sell it. They do still sell it, even though the brewery's not there. Uh, I remember me and my uh, one-time best friend, Nader, would go and buy a case. And uh, he always says, why don't we upgrade to buying pounders? And I'm like, Jimbo, what do you mean by pounders? He's like, well, they sell beer in a bottle that weighs a pound. And I was like, whoa, that just blew my mind. So I'm thinking, well, okay, but it's probably going to double or triple the price. But uh, no, no, it did not. It only increased the price by 60 cents. So you could always find 60 cents in the car, in your visor, in an, in home, in your drawer, somewhere. So after that, we really always got a case of Pounders. So we would drink a case of Pounders. It was $8.60. And, uh, you know, you got a pound of beer rather than 12 ounces. So you got four ounces per bottle more. And uh, boy, that seemed like a great deal. And this went on for years and years. And, uh, you know, a lot of our friends we grew up with, were in the area, and they also visited the uh, the Stoney's Brewery. Uh, this is not brought to you by Stoney's, by the way. I'm just uh, referencing them. Uh, but anyway, this went as far as years and years down the road that uh, another friend of mine came up with, let's make some shirts. So as of this day, I still have the shirt, the Stoney shirts that we came up with, the slogan that we made and that we bought and that we produced and we sold for, it might have been $10 a shirt, uh, and I have it hanging downstairs uh, in my uh, basement. It was a really, really well-known beer back then, but the shirt is what made it. So it was a brown polo shirt because the bottle was brown and the label was kind of white and red. So when you bought a case of Stoney's, it was red, black with some brown labeling on it. And uh, one of the slogans that we threw around, one of my other best friends came up with it was, uh, come to think of it, I'll have a pounder. That's exactly what came up out on the shirt. So we went around, we pressed all, well, we didn't press the shirts. We had somebody else make the shirts and we just sold them for $10 a shirt. So on one side, it had Stoney's beer. On the back, it said, come to think of it, I'll have a pounder. I'm like, that is great. That's a great slogan. Uh, one thing I'll note about Stoney's beer is uh, it wasn't very high in alcohol content. Uh, you actually had to probably drink 20 to 30 beers to probably get a buzz. I would say this is very low alcohol content. You could buy a six pack and you drank it and you felt nothing. So, uh, I mean, growing up as a kid, it wasn't really, I didn't really consider drinking alcohol because there was hardly anything in it. It was basically beer for people that had diabetes and Shirley's actually, uh, you know, came, I think she actually came up with the brewery. It might even been hers at one time or maybe her in the family that uh, started this own brewing company. Uh, but yeah, so as the story goes, we sold the we sold the shirts. Probably lasted for a few years. Don't know how many we sold, but every once in a while, growing up, I would see somebody with a shirt that says, "Come to think of it, I'll have a pounder," and it was really nice to know. It was a good feeling of knowing that I took part in that shirt. I mean, you could see people to, people you didn't even know. Strangers were wearing that shirt all around town. You know, I lived in a small meal town. Uh, in Amon Valley, and uh, it was tight knit, yeah, tight knit city. I'd say everybody knew kind of everybody that came in. If you didn't, it was somebody new that just moved to the area, and you're like, "Whoa, who's that?" You know, uh, I don't mean to move off 
move off the subject, but uh, you know, I can go into so many different ways, but you would see different people wearing different shirts all around. And mostly it was all about beer because that's what you did back in the small town I came up with is you drank beer, you went to work and you came back and you drank beer. So a lot of people that worked in a mill would just get off of work and they'd go straight to a bar. I'd always ask my dad, I'm like, dad, why, you know, these guys get off of work at eight o'clock in the morning and they go into a bar. He's like, yeah. I'm like, but that's breakfast time. Why would you even go into a bar at eight o'clock? He's like, no, Mark, these guys been working through the night all night. So they're hungry. They're starving. That eight o'clock to you in the morning is actually five o'clock in the afternoon to them. And then that's when it hit me. I'm like, whoa, if I get a job in the mill, since I didn't get the job in the brewery, I can maybe work the midnight shift, walk into a bar at eight o'clock and say, hey, give me a beer. So there was a bunch of beers. A uh, bunch of bars, actually, in Manesson that uh, housed a lot of the mill people that would come in after work because they, they worked around the clock. So all three shifts, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 bars in Pittsburgh that were right by the mill within walking distance. And uh, that would kind of, you know, uh, set the tone for the rest of the day. You'd go have a couple drinks before you went home and went to sleep and got ready for the next day. You know, there wasn't much of anything else to do. There was a river. There was, uh, uh, there was, I'll say, some trucking companies. There was a few car dealerships. There was a newspaper in the Mon Valley. Actually, it was called the uh, On Valley Independent. And, uh, you know, that's uh, that was one of the many businesses. But uh, things were thriving back in the 70s and 80s, uh, back whenever I was growing up. So that's my story on the beer and probably how it got started with myself. Uh, kind of introduced it to a lot of people now, and uh, a lot of people never heard of it, even though they know uh, that uh, the brewery is now closed, but Stoney's still out there. Uh, I think Anheuser-Busch, another large company, bought it. They just make it, but it's out of a different area than where it's from. So uh, that's kind of a little history of just some uh, alcohol drinking in the Mon Valley. So I'd like to pause here and uh, just gather some thoughts. Welcome back, everyone. We're back to Mark's podcast. I want to talk a little bit more about beer, which uh, which seems to uh, be the right subject to talk about every day, pretty much. Uh, I could talk about beer every day, probably. If we could fast forward just a little bit, uh, you know, my uh, my favorite beer probably growing up. Uh, I tried a few different beers, but if you really had something going on, like say a prom or a wedding or say a dance, you upgraded way upgraded from Stoney's. Back then, Heineken was the thing. If you were able to drink Heineken, you were rich. So you only had Heineken once or twice a year, uh, and you bought a case, and that case uh, might have been $30. So $30 back then is probably about $90 now. Yeah, so that was really, really the thing to do whenever you had some going out to do with your friends, and you wanted to show off a little. You know, you'd wash up, clean up the car, wash the car, go grab a case of Heineken. In fact, uh, one of their slogans was called Grab a Heine. Uh, I think I have one of those shirts, as a matter of fact. Uh, it had a picture of a Heineken. It was a long sleeve shirt that I bought in Ocean City, Maryland. Uh, that would be on a different podcast, uh, my experiences in Ocean City and buying shirts, because uh, that was one of my other favorite things to do was, uh, was shirt buying out at the beach. But uh, yeah, so they made these uh, Heineken shirts. Uh, it had a label on the front. Uh, I think it might have had a pocket, long sleeve, and on the back it said, grab a Heine. And in the middle of it, it uh, had a picture of a green bottle of Heineken. And if you were drinking a Heineken and had that grab a Heine shirt, man, you were really loving life then. That was just w the thing to do. So that was another time you'd probably just drink Heineken was maybe on vacation. So it was only on special occasions and it was on vacation. If you saved up all year to buy a case of Heineken, that's what you would do. And then you would celebrate it with your friends or uh, whoever you'd go out with. But uh, that was really a thing to do back in the day. Going along with that, uh, you know, my, uh, uh, my connoisseur of beer kind of moved on from there, kind of just moved up. As I grew up and got older, I'm thinking, why buy all these bottles of beer or cans of beer? Why not just start drinking kegs? But then the kegs were like, well, why and how are you going to purchase a keg and where are you going to store it? It has to stay cold or it's going to go flat. 
So that took a lot of researching and thinking. And remember back in the 70s and 80s, there was no internet. You couldn't just pull up stuff on your phone and find out what to do. So uh, there was just word of mouth. And just going out to weddings and parties and uh, drinking out of a keg, I would always see it just floating in a barrel of ice and just all over the place and uh, tap just falling all over and tipping over. So uh, other parties you'd go to that have a keg and a refrigerator. So me and my brother-in-law, we had an idea of just uh, putting a keg in a refrigerator. He's like, well, he's like, hey, Mark, I have a refrigerator that I'm really not using. It still works, but it's old and it's extra. All we have to do is plug it in, cut a hole in the front of it, and we could go buy all the lines and wires and taps and just hook it up and put a keg in there. You know, I said, Dave, that's really a great idea, but I wanted something a little bit more fancy, almost something that looked like a piece of furniture that I could show off and keep in my house. So I looked around and looked around and I came across a beer meister. It was the old 70 brown beer meister looking thing that you would purchase in a store that would look like a piece of furniture. You know, it was just... Uh, blended right in with all the furniture you had. So me and my one friend, Jimbo, we went down to the mall. And we went to Sears and they had one left. Could you believe it? They had one beer meister left. So I'm like, well, hold that. Let's hold that and I'll come back and buy it. Back in the day, you could put things on layaway. Uh, so it took me a while to save up for it. I believe it was $4.99 back in the day. So uh, it took me a few paychecks to to save up, but I was able to save up all the money to buy my first beer meister. And boy, that was the day. That was the day I would get my paycheck. I wouldn't even cash my paycheck. I was still living at home. I would just take my paycheck, put it in my dresser drawer. Wouldn't even cash it. Get the next paycheck, put it in a drawer, wouldn't cash it. And then I finally got up to when I had enough money to buy it. So I called my friend that had a truck and we headed down to the mall. He's like, Mark, this is epic do you believe what we're going to do? I'm like, yes, let's hope it works out. So we went to the mall, we got the beer, the beer Meister, and there was a couple problems with it when we got it home. First of all, it was a floor model, so it was missing some pieces. So uh, integral pieces, like before we could even start. So me and my friend's like, well, back to the mall again. Now, mind you, the mall was 45 minutes away, and 45 minutes away, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I was driving pretty far, but we went back down there, told them the pieces we were miss missing, and we were able to take the pieces off another floor model that they had, and uh, we were able to piece it back together at my house and uh, set it all up, and all we needed was a keg. So we turned the refrigerator on, and we had to go get a keg, and the first keg we got was Stoney's, of course. So Stoney's keg probably had about, I don't know, maybe... Uh, 15 cases in a keg for maybe $30. I don't even know. But uh, we went down and got it. And you have to put a $10 deposit on. So to this day, as a matter of fact, I was just talking about this with uh, some other friends uh, who said that, uh, I wonder if you could exchange that empty keg to get your $10 deposit back. I says, I don't know. I've been holding on to this $10 deposit keg because I don't want to waste my $10 from 1980. So... We talked about it, and it's still in my, my uh, well, now some people call it K-graders, uh, but uh, now, uh, you know, I'll just refer to it as a beer meister. That might be an outdated term, but, uh, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of work went into that beer meister. I mean, I had a lot of people look at it, a lot of, had a lot of people admire it. People would come over and go, wow, what is that? Why is that in your living room? It was in our kitchen growing up. My dad would drink out of it. My brother would drink out of it. I would drink out of it. And so on. Welcome back, folks. Uh, if you didn't notice before, but I did rather quickly stop that last segment. It was brought to my attention that the story I was telling wasn't completely accurate. So my wife was walking by, the lovely Kim. She walked by, looked at me and says, what are you talking about? That is not right. And she wanted to just clear it up. So she's clearing up the air, and I'm going to turn it over to her. I want to introduce to you Kim, my wife, and she's going to actually tell you how the beer meister got started in our house when we first got married, which seems to be a little different than my, my story. So take it away, Kim. Oh, thank you, Mark. 
Uh, the way that I remember the story is that you did save up your money. You did have your friend Jimbo help you with it. But the thing that I remember is that it was the very first item of furniture in our apartment before we got married. And you uh, purchased it, built it in our apartment. And um, I think that you had that in our apartment before we even had a couch in our apartment. <laughs> So that's the way that I remember the story. After that, it was such a hit that I believe your father then bought one and your brother bought one. And then I think eventually, years later, your brother-in-law bought one. So wait, you're telling me that that was the first thing that I bought in our apartment? Yep. And that is so much more important than... Yes. Any kitchen appliance, <laughs> any dresser, a couch, a bed, any table, uh, anything. Yep, uh, anything. Yep. Wow. That's what how I a remember. hobby. Yeah. <laughs> what a hobby, Kim. Wow, that went way back. Yes. Uh, that was what, mid 80s? Late 80s? Late 87, 88. Do you remember what year we got married? Oh, I do. Thank you very much. Okay. 1988. <laughs> a lovely year. Yes. Yes. That was great. So well, that's uh, how I remember the story, not to interrupt you. Oh, Not to correct you. Oh, that's quite all right. But uh, what are wives for? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining my podcast today. Uh, this might be my first and last podcast after the last comment. But uh, she says I'm going to get it. So I'm really excited. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but she says I'm going to get it. So as a kid, I always thought it was something good. But then after I got it, it was something really bad. So we shall see. But stay tuned for more podcasts from myself and my lovely wife, Kim.